Number 5. Kathleen and Grace Holmes During World War II, the Holmes family of London, England were bombed out of two of the three homes that they lived in. Like many other people living in London during World War II, they also lost a lot of friends and family. Several years after the war, the Holmes family was looking for a better life, so they immigrated to Australia in March 1949 and eventually settled in Tukley, New South Wales. On August 29, 1950, just weeks after the family settled into their new home, two of the Holmes' daughters, 18-year-old Kathleen and 11-year-old Grace, left the house to go for a walk. When they didn't return by nightfall, their parents contacted the police. The police and some local volunteers searched the area throughout the night. The girls were last seen alive at 5.15 p.m. when they stopped into a store to buy some candies. The morning after they left for their walk, a pair of searchers happened across three sets of footprints in the dirt. Two of the sets of footprints belonged to females, and then there was one large set of footprints that belonged to a man. They followed the footprints for three miles, and it led them to a swampy area known as the jungle. At the edge of the swamp, they found bloodstains, and there were signs of a struggle. Not far away, they found the bodies of the two sisters in ankle-deep, muddy water. Both of their faces had been beaten so severely that they were nearly unrecognizable. The murder weapon was described as a blunt, heavy object, quite possibly a bottle. The police could only think of one motive for the killings, and it was based on the way that 11-year-old Grace's clothes had been disturbed. They think that the man tried to sexually assault Grace, and her older sister tried to save her. There was one arrest made in the case, and it was a local fisherman named William Birdle. Birdle was one of the searchers, and the police thought that his footprints were similar to the ones found with the sister's footprints. However, since that was the only evidence against him, he was acquitted and the justice minister said that no further action would be taken against Birdle. Sadly, because the family had just immigrated to Australia, they didn't have much money and they couldn't afford headstones for Grace and Kathleen, who were buried side by side. 64 years after the murders, a local man was in the cemetery and he discovered that since their deaths, rocks had been used as tombstones. He started a GoFundMe account, and within a week he raised $2,500 for a headstone. While it's good news that the sisters finally got a proper monument, the bad news is that their killer will probably never face justice. Number 4. Bobby and David Phillips On December 7, 1992, Robert and Wanda Phillips of Tulsa, Oklahoma were out doing some Christmas shopping. When they returned home, they made a startling discovery. Just inside the front door, there was a trail of blood leading to another room. They followed the blood and they found the lifeless body of their 26-year-old son, Bobby. He had been beaten and hacked to death with an axe. The Phillips called the police and they arrived at the house a few minutes later. They searched the house and in one of the bedrooms, they made another heartbreaking discovery. The couple's other son, 19-year-old David, was dead from a gunshot wound to the head. Based on the evidence at the crime scene, the police think that there are two killers. The killers broke into the house while the family was out doing some Christmas shopping and then they waited for the victims to come home. While they waited, they watched MTV and drank soft drinks. They didn't search or ransack the house and the family's safe was untouched. David came home first and he was shot in the bedroom. Several hours later, Bobby returned home. He was attacked as soon as he walked in the door, and then his body was dragged to another room. After murdering the brothers, it appears that the killers tried to start a fire in the house to destroy any evidence, but the fire didn't catch. One aspect of the double homicide that originally stumped the police was that the brothers and the rest of the Phillips family didn't have any enemies, so there was no clear motive for the brutal slayings. When the police didn't make any arrests, the family assumed that the case went cold, but the police actually had a theory about who killed the brothers. The theory stems back to a double murder that happened in Tulsa over a year and a half before the brothers were killed. On the night of May 8, 1991, two men broke into the home of 30-year-old Coy and 28-year-old Tanya Wilkerson, who were asleep in bed. Each man held a pillow over the head of each victim, and then they shot them twice in the head. The killers then poured flammable liquid around the house and started a fire, but it didn't damage the house too much because the weather was too damp. Just hours after the murders, a woman saw two men burning some items in a secluded area not far from the murder scene, and then they got into a red car. 
The property that they were burning were personal items that belonged to the Wilkerson's, like their checkbook. A short time later, the police pulled over two men who were traveling in a red car that matched the one described by the woman. The men weren't arrested, but their information was passed along to the homicide detectives. The men inside the car were identified as 27-year-old Malon Butch Bastion and 16-year-old Jackie Leland Wright. Bastion was already on the detective's radar because he was a former employee at the company where Coy Wilkerson was vice president. Bastion had recently been fired and he swore that he'd get revenge. When the police went to arrest Bastion and Wright, the pair barricaded themselves in an apartment. After spending a night in the barricaded apartment, Wright surrendered. Bastion continued the standoff, which lasted for a total of 26 hours before he shot himself in the head. The question that the Phillips family had was how was this double murder connected to the killing of their sons? After all, the murders of the Wilkerson's happened a year and a half before their sons were killed and one of the killers committed suicide and the other one was arrested. Well, after the standoff, Jackie Wright wasn't immediately charged with the murders of Coy and Tanya Wilkerson because the police didn't have any physical evidence against him. The fact that he wasn't charged with the murders upset Tanya Wilkerson's parents, Jim and Jill Phillips. For months afterwards, they campaigned for Wright to be charged with the murders. Because of their campaign, Jim was harassed at his office. He received several threatening phone calls and someone even shot at one of his windows in his office. Shortly after the murders of the Phillips brothers, the harassment stopped. The theory from the police is that Wright wanted to silence Tanya's parents, Jim and Jill Phillips, but accidentally targeted the wrong Phillips household and killed the brothers. The two Phillips families weren't related and they didn't know each other, but there was one other similarity that they shared besides their last names. Jim and Jill Phillips lived in the city of Owasso, which is a short drive from Tulsa, and Bobby and David Phillips lived on Oswego Avenue in Tulsa. The police think that the killers confused the two words and broke into the wrong home. There was also a major similarity in both sets of murders. After killing both victims, the murderers tried to start a fire to destroy the evidence. Jackie Wright has never been charged in connection with the murders of Bobby and David Phillips, and the murders of the brothers is considered unsolved. Wright was finally charged with the murders of Coy and Tanya Wilkerson in October 1997, six years after they happened. He was convicted of two counts of second-degree murder in 1998, and he was sentenced to life without parole. Number 3. Susan and Mary Raker On September 2, 1974, 15-year-old Mary and 12-year-old Susan Raker left their house in St. Cloud, Minnesota to walk a mile to a department store to buy some school supplies. When they didn't return home for dinner, their parents contacted the police. 26 long days would go by before the Rakers learned what happened to their two daughters, and it wasn't good news. Susan's body was found under some brush in a quarry. She had been stabbed 13 times. Not far from her body, 40 feet below the water, was the naked body of Mary. She had been stabbed six times. The double murder shocked the citizens of St. Cloud, but no arrests were ever made in the case. Over the years, the police and the media have come up with several different suspects. One of the most prominent suspects was a man named Richard Eckroth. He was a monk that lived in St. John's Abbey in Collegeville, Minnesota, which isn't far from St. Cloud. In the 1970s, Eckroth took dozens of children to his remote cabin. Years later, when those children grew up, they accused Eckroth of sexually abusing them and he threatened to kill them if they said anything about the abuse. Two of the young people who went to the cabin with Eckroth were Mary and Susan Raker, who went to the cabin twice in the two years before they were killed. In the 1990s, during a lawsuit regarding sexual abuse, Eckroth took a polygraph test and he was asked if he killed the Raker sisters. Eckroth said that he wasn't the killer, and he passed the polygraph test. Another suspect is a man named Herb Notch, who was 16 at the time of the murders. In 1976, nearly two years to the date of the murder of the Raker sisters, Notch and his friend decided to rob a convenience store in St. Cloud. They walked into the store, armed with a gun, and they found 14-year-old Sue Dukowitz working alone. They kidnapped her and drove her to a remote gravel pit. Notch used a knife to cut the girl's clothes down the front, and then he sexually assaulted her. When Notch was done, he stabbed Sue and then hid her body under some brush. Amazingly, Sue wasn't dead. After Notch and his friend left, she walked half a mile and found some help. 
Luckily, she survived the attack. Notch and his friend were arrested a short time later. Notch was given a 40-year sentence, but he was out of prison by the late 1980s. Why some people think Notch is a viable suspect is because of a few striking similarities between the murders of the Raker sisters and the attack on Sue Dukowitz. All three victims were taken out to an isolated area, all three were stabbed, and both Susan and Sue were hidden under brush. But most notably, just like Sue, Mary's clothes had been cut down the front with a knife. Since his release from prison, Notch has had several run-ins with the law. In one case, he was convicted of threatening his former girlfriend with a knife. When the police were asked if Herb Notch was ever a suspect in the Raker case, they refused to comment. A final possibility in the murders of the Raker sisters is that Mary may have been stalked or threatened before she was killed. When she was missing, her parents read her diary, and just before she disappeared, she wrote an entry that said, If I am murdered, find my killer. See that justice wins over. I have a few reasons to fear for my life, and what I ask is important. Sadly, Mary's wish has yet to be honored, and no one has ever been charged in connection with the murder of her and her sister. Number 2. Stanley Park's Babes in the Woods In January 1953, a gardener working in Stanley Park in Vancouver, British Columbia, came across a small human skull. When the police searched the area, they found the bones of two small children. Originally, they thought that the bones belonged to a boy and a girl, probably between the ages of 6 and 10. Along with the skeletal remains, there was also a hatchet, which was determined to be the murder weapon. One of the skulls had markings from the blade of the hatchet, while the other one had markings from the hammer end of the hatchet. The police concluded that the children were led into the woods and attacked and killed there. After the attack, a woman's fur coat was draped over them. Also at the crime scene, they found one woman's shoe under the bones, a rusted metal lunchbox, bits of children's clothing, and two leather aviator caps that children wore to look like World War II pilots. Finally, there was a pair of children's shoes. The police at the time thought that the shoes were only imported into Canada after the end of World War II. Due to the availability of the shoes, the state of decomposition, and other evidence left at the scene, it led police to speculate that the murders probably happened in October 1947. Since there were no reports of missing children that matched the bones, the police thought that a parent or guardian committed the murders. Also, since they didn't have missing child reports that corresponded with the bones, the police were not able to identify the victims. Without any leads, the case of the babes in the woods quickly went cold. In the 1990s, a sergeant with the Vancouver police named Brian Honeyborn started to look into the case. One of the first things that he did was have an expert test the DNA from the bones. He determined that the bones didn't belong to a boy and a girl, instead it was two boys. They were half-brothers, they shared the same mother, but had different fathers, and they were probably between the ages of 5 and 8. He also found out that the shoes were available in Canada during World War II, so the murders could have happened much earlier than originally thought. Unfortunately, these errors most likely hindered the investigation, because the police were looking for witnesses who saw a boy and the girl in the park during the fall of 1947. When looking through old case files, Honeyborn found a witness account from 1944 that said a couple saw a man and a woman in the park with two boys. The couple remembered them because the man was holding a hatchet, which he banged on a metal railing as he walked. A short time later, they saw the man and the woman without the children. The woman was also wearing one shoe, and it was covered in blood. This has led Honeyborn to believe that the boys were actually murdered in 1944 and not 1947. Stanley Park's babes in the woods have never been identified, and even though Honeyborn is retired, he is still looking into the case, but he does not think that it will ever be solved. Number 1. The Tan Siblings January 6, 1979 was a normal one for the Tan family of Geelang, Beirut, Singapore. Tan Quinn Chai and his wife, Li Mei Ying, left their home at 6.30 in the morning to drive students to school in their minibus. As per usual, they left their four children, Tan Kok Peng, who was 10, Tan Kok Hin, who was 8, Tan Kok Soon, who was 6, and their sister, 5-year-old Tan Chin Ni, at home sleeping. At 7.10 a.m., Mei Ying called their flat to wake up the children so that they could get ready for school. On that morning, none of the children answered the phone. Mei Ying called a few more times, 
but there was no answer each time. She called a neighbor and asked them to check in on the kids. The neighbor knocked on the door of the flat, but there was no answer. At 10 o'clock, Mei Ying and Quinn Chai returned home, and in the bathroom, they found the bodies of their four children. The bodies were stacked neatly on top of each other, and all of them had died grisly deaths. They had all been slashed a minimum of 20 times around the head area. The oldest boy's arm was nearly severed, and there were strands of hair in his hand, indicating that he probably fought back against his attacker. The murder weapons, which were never recovered, are believed to have been a butcher knife from the kitchen and a dagger. In the flat, there were no signs of a struggle, and the killer didn't break in. Instead, the killer most likely used a key that Mei Ying had lost some time before the murders. The police think that the massacre was a premeditated attack. Using the key, he entered the apartment, and one by one, he carried each child to the bathroom, where he slashed and hacked them to death. After he was done, he washed up and calmly walked out of the flat. Since it was a premeditated attack, the police think that the killer knew the family and had a grudge against them. This theory was given more credence two weeks after the murders when the grieving parents received a disturbing Chinese New Year's card. On the front of the card, it was a photograph of happy children playing. Inside the card, there was a message written in Mandarin, and it said, Now you can have no more offspring. Ha, ha, ha. And then the writer signed off the card as the murderer. What was disturbing about the card was that after Mei Ying gave birth to her daughter, she got sterilized, suggesting that the killer knew intimate details about the family. The police interviewed over 100 people, and the most promising lead came from a cab driver who picked up a man in the area of the murder around 8 o'clock. The man had blood on him, and he was carrying a knife in his coat. The taxi driver was able to pick the man out of a lineup, and he was a family friend of the Tans. He was so close to the family that the Tan children called him uncle. The police had no evidence against him, so he was never charged with the murders. Losing all their children devastated Mei Ying and Quin Chai. They said that any time that they heard children playing outside their flat, it sent pangs of grief through them. They tried to adopt children, but there was no babies to adopt at the time. Instead, Mei Ying had surgery to reverse her sterilization in 1981. Two years later, on December 30th, 1983, Mei Ying, who was 35, gave birth to a healthy baby boy. The couple was overjoyed with the birth of their new son, but they are worried that the killer of their first four children will never be identified. Thanks for watching this week's video. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please subscribe. We post a new video every Sunday. Also, we want to thank everyone who already does subscribe. You guys are amazing. If you want to check out another video about unsolved murders, please click on one of the videos on the screen now. And thanks again for watching.